The T Biz Podcast delivers T news that you need to know. A recap of the week's major headlines with commentary and cultural trends hosted by Dan Bolton. It is the voice of origin for tea professionals and enthusiasts worldwide. Tea nourishes and inspires. It is an ancient plant based medicine that simultaneously heals and energizes the body as it soothes the mind. Making fine tea is a blend of artistry and craftsmanship. The $200 billion tea trade is fundamentally local, yet exerts global influence, employing millions to enhance the well-being of all. Hello, everyone. Here are this week's headlines. Planting Hope Acquires Cargo Teas Assets The food tech venture will market tea and veggies to college students. Bangladesh adds a third tea auction center that opens next week. And coffee overtakes tea consumption in the UK. Plus, Thirst founder and CEO Sabina Banerjee is overseeing a three-year human rights impact assessment of the tea industry. In August, she toured Kenya and Tanzania, seeking examples of innovative alternative approaches to better understand how tea workers and farmers see the future of tea. She joins Tea Biz from Oxford, England, to share insights from her travels. More in a minute, but first, this important message. What makes a perfect cup of Ceylon tea? The perfect cup is from the tea businesses that ensure the protection of all the children living within their tea estates. We salute Kailani Valley, Telawakili, Bogawanthalawa, Harana, and Eliftia Tea Estates. Support Save the Children, Sri Lanka. Vancouver-based Planting Hope, a food tech venture launched in 2020 to promote plant-based foods and beverages, has acquired eight Argo Cafe licenses, $600,000 worth of inventory, and master supplier agreements with Sodexo, Aramark, and other food service operators. The company announced plans to expand to additional university locations and market a range of, quote, on-trend products that are delicious, nutritious, and planet-friendly. Examples include sesame milk, veggie rice bowls, veggie chips, and veggie copia, snack items popular with Generation Z. The price was not disclosed. A press release described a loan agreement providing financing up to $1 million. Planting Hope spokesperson Julia Stamberger said, quote, We're extremely excited about the partnership with Argo and the ability to integrate the Argo brand and relationships into Planting Hope's go-forward strategy, end quote. The Argo University cafes will provide us with direct access to our core Generation Z demographic at a pivotal point in their lives when trying new foods and beverages and adopting lifelong choices, she said. The cafes will test new products and beverage recipes. Planting Hope will earn a royalty on gross sales transacted through these cafes. The company is not operating the cafes. No direct operational leases or liabilities are part of the transaction. Aramark or Sodexo staffs most locations. Twenty years ago, Chicago-based Argo Tea, a pioneer in the specialty cafe and ready-to-drink segment, opened a storefront that revitalized U.S. tea retail, demonstrating the profitability of multi-channel distribution. Argo brewed fresh tea into a concentrate at centralized bottling facilities, making it one of the first tea retailers to blend tea at the counter like a mixologist, Beverages can be customized to meet preferences in caffeine, the level of sweetness, and flavor. By 2010, Argo operated 26 cafes, expanding to New York City, St. Louis, and Boston, with more than a dozen Chicago locations. 
At its peak, the company had 50 cafes and kiosks with single-serve bottled teas available in over 10,000 grocery stores, including Whole Foods Market, 7-Eleven, and Safeway. Privately held, the firm did not disclose earnings, but with overseas locations in Beirut, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, and Kuwait, and distribution in grocery and convenience outlets, annual sales topped $60 million 10 years after the brand launched, according to co-founder Arsen Avakian. The pandemic closed the company's downtown locations and work-from-home resilience prevented a quick recovery, forcing a sale in 2020 to Golden Fleece Beverages. Tiosks, airport, hospital, and campus food halls fared better than the standard 1,200-square-foot cafe. Currently, there are no company-owned locations. Candace Pappas, former president of Golden Fleece, who worked 16 years at Argo, will join Planting Hope as a vice president responsible for food service development. Next week, a tea auction center will open in Bangladesh's Panjagar tea growing region. Minister for Commerce Tipu Munshi will inaugurate the center on September 2nd. The online auction center will serve plantation and bought leaf suppliers that accounted for 19% of the country's total production last year, a new record. The Salat and Shanagram regions produced 81% of the nation's tea, which totaled 93.8 million kilos in fiscal 2022. Bangladesh experienced a slow start in January, but tea production through July is currently 4.6% ahead of last year. The Bangladesh Tea Board reports a mid-year harvest total of 40 million kilos. Production was 38.3 million kilos during the same period in 2022. Exports last year rose by over 200,000 kilos to 849,000 kilos. The tea was valued at 20.51 crore takas, about 205 million rupees or 195 million U.S. dollars. The country exported 639,000 kilos of tea in fiscal 2022. The top exporters were Ceylon tea, Finlay tea, Kazi and Kazi tea, Espahani tea, and Bengal city estate tea. There are 168 tea estates cultivating 164,000 acres of tea lands. Panchaga is projected to produce an estimated 20 million kilos of green leaf in the fiscal year. Business Insight This might just be the year that Bangladesh achieves its 100 million kilo production goal, an elusive target narrowly missed in recent years. Steady rains following the early dry spell boosted yields through July. The growing season winds down in October. In the mid-18th century, tea replaced ale and gin as the drink of the masses to become Britain's most popular beverage for more than two centuries. Coffee is the new favorite, according to market research firm Statista. The latest Statista Global Consumer Survey, released August 21st, found that 63% of Britons regularly drink coffee, while 59% regularly drink tea. In 2021, Statista's annual survey showed beverage drinkers evenly split. Kantar point-of-sales research showed that supermarkets sold 533 million packs of coffee, during the period January through March 2023. UK consumers purchased 287 million packets of tea. Britons consume an estimated 95 million cups of coffee daily. Nespresso UK CEO Anna Lundstrom told the UK's Daily Mail, quote, The UK's coffee scene is one of the world's most dynamic and exciting. This is really a nation of coffee lovers, end quote. Instant coffee is preferred, but sales of coffee pods are the fastest-growing coffee segment, and there are now 7,736 cafes and coffee shops in the U.K., 
up slightly from 2022, according to Ibis World. Tea consumption has been falling in the UK since the early 1970s, declining 20% by 1986 when sales of the more expensive coffee first exceeded tea. In 2014, per capita consumption was only 25 grams per week, down from 68 grams per week in 1974. In the U.S., coffee is more widely consumed than tea, with 64% of American adults drinking at least one cup of coffee per day, but the 37% who prefer tea consume more cups daily on average. In Europe, 56% of adults prefer coffee, while 27% prefer tea. In Asia, tea is the overwhelming favorite. In India, for example, 79% of adults say they prefer tea to the 19% who choose coffee. Business Insight Globally, adults consume an estimated 2.5 billion cups of coffee daily. In March, Statista reported tea consumption had increased to 6.7 billion kilos in 2022, enough to brew 3 billion cups a day. Their estimate does not include herbal tea, instant tea, or tea in ready-to-drink bottles and cans. Tea consumption is projected to exceed 7 billion kilos globally in 2023 and is accelerating to an estimated 7.5 billion kilos by 2026. Global consumption was 5 billion kilos in 2015, reaching 6 billion kilos in 2017. In 2022, tea drinkers consumed 297 billion liters worldwide. Arvinda Anand Theraman in Bengaluru reports on tea auction prices for sale 34. India Tea Price Report for Sale 34, the week ending 26th August 2023. Overall, some 21,900 tons of tea were on at auctions this week with an overall sale volume of 69%. North India saw 18,000 tons tea on offer with a 68% sale volume. BP and BOP SM grades were top selling, followed by dust and fannings. Kolkata saw good demand for CTC and Orthodox with Middle East and CIS countries active for the latter. Prices were similar to last week, but lower when compared with the same sale week last year. About half the Darjeeling on offer was sold, but prices have dropped since last week, with a little over 50% sold for under 300 rupees a kilo. Gohati saw good demand with major blenders active for both leaf and dust grades. Prices were similar to last week, but like Calcutta, lower in comparison with the same sale week last year. In the south, about 3,756 tons were on offer with a 75% sale volume and average sale price of 104 rupees a kilo. Dust and fannings were top selling grades. In Cochin, CTC did well with sale volume of 83%, while Orthodox grades fared well in Kunur with an 88% sale volume and an average price of 100 rupees a kilo. In weather, light to moderate rain is expected in most of the three regions across India, whether North Bengal or Assam in the north and Nilgiris in the south. And now, a word from our sponsor. Hi, I'm Nish. I grew up in an organic tea farm and I founded Nepal Tea Collective in 2016. Tea is not just a beverage for me, but a catalyst for social change, sustainably empowering hardworking artisans like my parents for the past 30 years. I'm on a mission to make the whole world aware of the goodness of Nepali teas and the good that comes from supporting growers in this remarkable land. If you haven't tasted Nepali teas yet, you're missing out. Our award-winning teas are making headlines. Find out why. Visit Nepal Tea Collective's website to get a free sample of this extraordinary taste of the Himalayas. That's nepalteacollective.com. Or just send me an email at nish, N-I-S-H, at nepalteacollective.com. Cheers. Thirst founder and CEO Sabita Banerjee is overseeing a three-year human rights impact assessment of the tea industry. 
In August, she toured Kenya and Tanzania, seeking examples of innovative alternative approaches to better understand how tea workers and farmers see the future of tea. She joins TeaBiz from Oxford, England, to share insights from her trip. Sabita Banerjee founded Thirst in 2018. The nonprofit platform she heads is working towards a stronger, fairer, more resilient tea industry in both tea producing and tea consuming countries. Her consultancy advocates global trade benefits for stakeholders beyond shareholders. Sabita has a long history of advocacy. She joined Oxfam in 1984 and advanced ahead of internal communications for four years before working as a joint team coordinator and later as a technical and policy advisor. Sabita became a supply chain expert advising the Ethical Trading Initiative for six years. Before that, she directed Just Change Network, an Oxford volunteer group working with the Adivisi people in South India. Sabita graduated from the University of Bristol studying philosophy and English. She spent the early years of her career working in India. I'm excited to hear about your trip to East Africa, Sabita, especially Tanzania, as I will travel there in October to report on Kazia 2. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Dan. It's great to be here, and I'm really looking forward to talking about um, some of the amazing um, smallholder farmers that I've just been visiting in Tanzania and Kenya. Tea smallholders now produce most of the world's tea by volume, yet retain only a small fraction of its value. To prosper, small and medium enterprises must add value at origin. The first step is learning to produce consistent, high-quality tea at scale. I'm completely on the same page as you, and and I think that um, this model of smallholder farmers sort of aggregating is is what's gradually going to replace plantations in in the long run. I mean, what what really interests me about that model is it actually links back to something I read about years and years ago, which was a book by Kevin Kelly, who used to be the editor of Wired magazine um, called Out of Control. But um, he described this idea that when the control of something is distributed amongst its elements, it actually makes for a much more powerful, stronger and sustainable and more efficient entity. And it seems to me that that's what's naturally starting to happen in the tea sector, that the plantations worked in an economic sense and I suppose partially some would say in in a social sense as well for what is it nearly 200 years now but but now that model is is actually struggling to be economically viable and it's struggling to be sort of socially and morally viable with the increasing kind of pressures on companies to ensure that you know workers have their um, own autonomy that they're living you know decent um, lives that they're having sufficient income and um, you know i've seen some very good plantations um in my travels in india in tanzania in kenya and i'm sure there are others in many other countries as well but at the end of the day a plantation is still a plantation and the workers are still workers in that in that large entity the alternative model that's starting to emerge and what what i've just seen in this three-week trip around Tanzania and then Kenya, where I've visited many different smallholder farms and a few plantations as well. And just comparing the two, the difference between how a, a tea plantation worker lives and how a tea s- smallholder farmer lives is is really quite significant and you know i'm not saying that a smallholder farmer's life is easy far from it it's hugely hard work and you know in in some senses that 
the the typical day of a smallholder farmer, particularly the woman, is is in some ways no easier than that of a tea plantation worker. She has to get up at four in the morning, fetch water, get the kids ready for school, make make food, then go out to the fields and work. Then, you know, I spoke to one woman who said that the tea collection centre was like between one and four kilometres away. There were various she could go to. And she can carry on her head 30 kilograms at a time. Um, but if she's produced 150 kilograms, then she has to make that journey uh, five times. So it's a hard, hard life. But she has her own house. She has her own land. She can diversify. She can plant other things on her crop. She can build on her house, extend it if she can and if she wants to. Um, there's a certain dignity and self-respect in that model, as well as a certain sort of agility built into it. A central factory will have collection centres around its immediate area, and then individual farmers will bring their leaf to that collection centre. So they are both part of a of a bigger whole, the, the whole entity of that region, as you were saying, and are contributing to it, but they're also autonomous and I think that combination is really, really promising. You just described a typical bought leaf factory supplied by independent smallholders. What other models are working? I saw four different versions of that um, smallholder aggregated model, which I found um, very interesting. I have, before I go into them, I have to also just say that um, Thirst has is, the reason we did this trip and the reason why Damraj is going to Sri Lanka to do the same. We're planning to document as many of these alternative approaches as we can because I think alternatives are now needed. So the tea industry is, you know, really up against it. So the the four different models that I saw um, in Tanzania block farming. And then also um, the uh, Kazi Yetu model that you have, have mentioned, where it, which is a social enterprise and working on a much smaller scale, but focusing on speciality tea and, and a sort of speciality market. And then a cooperative society in Kenya. And finally, the Kenya Tea Development Agency, which is, you know, well established. It's not new, but it really works. Will you share some brief observations about all four? Let's start with the block farming model and describe how that works. Block farming, um, this is a model that I came across in southern Tanzania, in the southern hills there. This was a project supported by the, the Wood Foundation. They have, I believe, a similar model in Rwanda, which I haven't visited. But in Tanzania, they helped to set up a company called the Njombe um, Outgrowers Services Company, which um, exists to help smallholder farmers set up in, in tea production in this block farming model. But just before we go, I think um, we painted quite a rosy picture of the of, of it. But I think we shouldn't underestimate the challenges that those farmers are facing. But the other issue um, that I think is important to um, to focus on is I think almost all the models we've talked about have involved having some sort of injection of funds from a foundation or an NGO and it's almost like that that industry can't manage on its own without something external being put in, you know, as a, almost as charity. Um, whereas, you know, this is a product, the, the most popular drink in the, in the world after water. Why should it be depending on um, injections from charities? You know, it should be able to earn enough to support the people who produce this amazing yeah. product. Intrigued by what you've heard in today's podcast? Would you like to learn more from our global network of T-Biz journalists and tea experts? Remember to visit the T-Biz website for more comprehensive coverage. That's www.t-bizbiz.com. 
Thanks for listening. Farewell till next week. Produced by Audavita Studios. Connect your voice to the world.